My name is Trishan Karthik Kupsami. I'm Justin I'm, Kapos. Yeah, sorry, sorry. And uh, I'm a security engineer at Datadog. So before joining Datadog, I worked on my PhD at NYU Tandon with Justin Kapos, uh, who was my PhD advisor, and where I led the research and development of Tuff. At the same time, Docker implemented Docker Content Trust and Notary, which used Tuff to secure the distribution of container images. This led to Tuff becoming a member project of the CNCF, which we're very proud of. And so a pleasure today to take you into a deep dive into Tuff and show you how you can use it to secure software updates in uh, various demanding settings. So let's, let's go straight into it. <clears throat> First, let's remind ourselves of the problem we're trying to solve. Experts agree that software updates are the most important thing you can do to remain secure online. This is because updates fix security vulnerabilities that can be remotely exploited by attackers. Although it's crucial to update software to remain secure online, an important part of the picture is often neglected. And that is a compromise of the repository used to serve software updates. And when this happens, the impact is huge. Attackers get to compromise millions of devices all at once. The popularity of repositories is precisely what makes them attractive targets to attackers, especially nation-state attackers who have the resources and motive to carry out such attacks. So we believe it is prudent to assume that it's a question of when, not if, a repository compromise is going to happen. Now, our goal is not to prevent a compromise. Rather, even if attackers have compromised the repository and have access to signing keys kept on the repository, the damage that they can do must be limited to the greatest possible extent. We can use the update framework or TUF for short, as the foundation for building compromise resilience software repositories. Before I talk about TUF, let me quickly dispatch some background. A repository is a server that contains both packages and metadata. A package is the smallest unit of update, which could be either a software library or an application. The repository also contains metadata such as cryptographic hashes and file sizes about either packages or even other metadata files. Having dispatched that background out of the way, we're now ready to see how Tuff uses a few simple yet powerful design principles to ensure that repositories can severely limit the impact of a key compromise as well as recover from them. First, different types of metadata assigned uh, by different roles using different keys so that the impact of a key compromise is minimized and does not necessarily affect the security of the whole system. There are four top-level roles controlled by administrators. So let's take a look at them one by one. The targets role provides metadata about packages themselves. Administrators may delegate the responsibility of signing packages to other developers who may in turn delegate this responsibility to yet other developers. Delegations uh, bind packages to keys, to public keys, and serve as a natural way for administrators and developers to distribute, revoke, and replace keys for other developers. The snapshot role, which builds on top of that, indicates which packages have been released together at the same time by different developers on the repository. Building on top of that, the timestamp role provides a quick summary of whether any metadata or package has been updated in the repository at all. Finally, the root role uh, acts as the root of trust for the whole system and distributes the public keys for all four top-level roles, including itself. Putting it all together, uh, when you use different roles with different keys to sign different types of metadata, the impact of a key compromise does not necessarily affect the security of the whole system. Or as grandma would say, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. It's good to listen to grandma. The second design principle is that a minimum number of keys may be required to sign off a metadata file so that attackers must compromise this threshold number of keys in order to install malware. 
So for example, you could require three out of four different keys, any three, three of them, to require uh, to, to sign that metadata file before you trust it. Or as grandma would say, when you have to launch nuclear missiles, make sure you use different keys. Do you know what they do on, uh, on these actual systems? A student once told me that even if the same person has two keys, he can't physically put the keys and turn them together because they're spaced far enough apart. So people have uh, really thought this through. The third principle is that since keys can be compromised, you need ways to revoke keys. The first way is to revoke keys explicitly by publishing new keys to replace old ones. Alternatively, what we do in TUF is by default set expiration timestamps on all the metadata files, which acts as a natural incentive for you to replace and rotate keys anyway. Fourth, the risk of a key compromise can be severely minimized by using offline keys or signing keys kept off the repository on cold storage. For example, in USB sticks and safe deposit boxes. Or as grandma would say, yet again, don't keep the keys to the kingdom under the carpet. Last but not least, um, one of the most overlooked design principles is that TUF allows for using a diversity of cryptographic hashing and signing algorithms so that the compromise of any one of them is not sufficient to cause total failure. You could even do interesting things like try post-quantum cryptographic schemes at the same time. Now let me hand it off to Justin, who also is the consensus builder for the TUF project, to talk about how it has and does evolve. All right, thank you very much, Trishank. So I'm too excited to just stand here behind the podium, so I'm gonna bounce around a little bit as I, as I talk through this. So um, one of the things that I'm really excited about in, in working on the TUF project is the community. So uh, really what, what we have is we have quite a stable spec in, you know, for doing updates in a secure way, but um, this spec gets tweaked and updated as different people use Tuft in all sorts of cool different domains. So uh, you can see there's a whole bunch of tabs here that have, have made it through, that have been approved, that are now things that in order to actually implement Tuft you have to do that came from different domains, and we're you know, in the process of going and adding others as we speak. So what I'm uh, gonna do now is I'm gonna walk you through four of the different things that have made it into Tough and talk to you a little bit and just kind of give you a little glimpse about what our community's like and what it's like to be, uh, you know, to contribute in this space. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, a tap that we're uh, currently in the process of finalizing, tap eight. It deals with key rotation and self-revocation. And so uh, let's say you have a scenario here where you have someone, Jane. Jane can either be a project or Jane can be an individual developer. In this case, uh, we'll just have Jane be an individual developer, and Jane happens to be a really popular individual developer. So lots of people are like, hey, you know, I like Jane's stuff, so I'm gonna use Jane's stuff, and I'm gonna refer to Jane's, uh, Jane's packages. So if you know, A, B, and C wanna install things, they're all gonna say, hey, you know, Jane has this library that we like to use, for instance. Jane has a key, okay? And now let's say that, that Jane goes and buys a new laptop or something and gets a new, gets a new key, gets a new, uh, you know, token for this new device. Now Jane has a bit of a problem because Jane has to go and tell A and B and C all to update their information referring to Jane to say, hey, use this new key, okay? Um, and that's a pain in the butt, right? Also, um, let's say that Jane, you know, some evil hacker gets in and steals Jane's old uh, key uh, and uh, now Jane has to really quickly get A, B, and C to revoke it because all those users are potentially at risk, only it turns out that B is maybe out on vacation or something like that. So this is not only you know, kind of a usability problem for people, but it also can be a security problem. All right, so the solution is uh, something called self-rotation or revocation. And this is the ability for Jane to go, and when Jane wants to go and have a new key or something, she can sign something that says, hey, you used to trust this one key for me, now you should trust these these two keys, right? And Or she can sign something with her two keys and say, oh, you used to trust these two keys, now get rid of a key or do other things like that. So she can effectively say, if you used to trust this old thing, now rotate that trust to this new um, thing. And in the case that there's something like a compromise or a key disclosure or something like that, then uh, Jane or anyone who possesses uh, Jane's, like, you know, an accurate set of Jane's keys in there is able to go and say, don't trust uh, Jane anymore. So it's a way to go 
And if your keys get out there, somebody steals them and then tries to do a rotate or something, you can say, no, 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 we need to self-revoke. You shouldn't trust things in this, in this domain. Um, and this is uh, work that uh, I've been doing along with uh, Hannes from the OCaml community uh, who really came with this use case as part of their integration and uh, has been led in many ways by my student, uh, Marina Moore, who's put a lot of effort into this. Uh, so another uh, cool thing that we have uh, that we actually integrated quite a while ago uh, is uh, a tab called Tap5. This deals with splitting repository location across URLs. So I'll talk uh, kind of quickly about this. So sometimes you want to refer to multiple different repositories. And you might have a repository where you only want to get some software from it. Like maybe it hosts a whole bunch of different things, but you really want to say this one package, you should get it from here, but you shouldn't really get other stuff from there. So um, there, you, know, you want to have a way to be able to refer to this. And uh, there's a clear cloud native use cases. This is actually uh, something that uh, came to us from working with the folks at CoreOS with some of the stuff they're doing on Quay where they want to say for enterprise users, enterprise users should only see these types of files on a repo or should only should be able to access these types of things. And uh, there are actually a whole bunch of other cloud native use cases as we later found out as we went and started to work with folks in, in the Docker and other communities and started to talk with folks outside of even the cloud native space where this has a bunch of implications for the way nation state actors, what can happen if let's say you have a service that you're hosting in China and the Chinese government comes and like seizes your server or you know, is trying to compel you to do different things, how, you know, it, there are still ways to use this to make your system be effectively secure. So um, you know, this was a, a really fun process working with folks at CoreOS and, and Docker and, and elsewhere uh, in order to, to add this improvement. Um, so the, the third tap I'm going to talk about deals with multi-repository consensus. And this is a scenario where you have this sort of problem. So let's say uh, that we're going to kind of flip the model a little bit here. So uh, the place where this came up for this is actually in the context of automobiles. Uh, in automobiles, at a first glance, at least to me, as a naive person four years ago, it's like, hey, it's not that different. You know, they have computers. It's, you know, they even run like Linux variants you know, on, on some of this stuff. So hey, you know, it's not that different from um, the traditional way you think of updating things in the cloud or the traditional desktop. But that's very definitely wrong. And one of the ways that it's different is the fact that the, the OEM, the person who you think of as, as buying your car, like Toyota or Ford or whoever, is actually in control of what updates get pushed to your car. And the individual things on your car are very weak, very small devices that often don't have their own, you know, almost never have their own network connection out. They usually go out through something like a telematics unit, which is a big, complicated, very likely to be compromised uh, piece of hardware on, on your network. And so if you, if you just kind of flip your mindset for a, a moment and imagine that your repository should be telling you what to install rather than the devices making any decisions about that, um, then uh, we're going to see that there's going to be a problem here for a moment. So let's say that on this repository, you keep a, a key that you're going to use to sign things online. You keep this key on the repo. The repo is going to you know, uh, then tell you, install packages x, y, and z with these hashes. The problem is, is that when the attacker goes and breaks in here, then the attacker has the ability to tell you to in install whatever horrible like crypto miner or keylogger or whatever bad software they want, because you have this one repo and you have this key for it. So you say, OK, well, I, I've learned something about, you know, from Trishank's discussion before, that offline keys are better if we can get away from them, with them from a usability standpoint. And so maybe I'll just put my key in a safety deposit box and then, you know, or a threshold of keys and not have to worry about it. But the problem is, is that you can't be responsive then. When a car comes to you and says, hey, what packages, you know, what am I supposed to install? How is this supposed to work? You have to sort of immediately be able to customize and tell it you need to have uh, these different pieces of software installed. There's a surprising amount of customization that goes in. Um, and, and they will install different packages on different cars with different service models, um, depending on different use cases. You know, the government vehicles will get different software for their same ECUs and things like that as, as others. So it's very customized. Even um, some of the big um, rental car companies and things have their own way of doing things. So it's, it's, it's difficult. So the idea behind TAP4 is to use actually two repositories. So with two repositories, you can have an image repository that says, these are valid software, uh, pieces of software that could be installed. And it can say things like, this is a valid piece of software that can be installed on this model of brake controller. 
right? And this is signed with an offline key. And then in addition to this, there's another repository called the directory repository that says, and you as a vehicle should install these things. And it has to match both of these. So things have to be on both of these lists. You ha they have to be signed with this offline key as a valid image. And then the director has to say, and this applies to your vehicle, right? And this is you know, actually very relevant for, even in the cloud native space, for some scenarios involving nation state actors. Um, and this work, like this whole problem domain space, came out of work that we did with the automakers. Uh, I don't know if anyone has dealt with the automotive community, but they're extraordinarily secretive in ways that is really weird to me to the point where I go to automotive conferences and people will come up to me like, Psst, come here, I got a demo to show you. And then it's like, check this out. This is running Uptane, your tough variant. And I'm like, cool, why don't you tell everybody? No, 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 no. Um, we don't have approval to, to say this through like the 18 levels of management. It's really strange, very odd domain. Um, but we've had Uptane uh, be adopted by one of the big three US automakers, by major automakers in Asia. Um, we have a, a major automaker in Europe that is inking the deal now. Um, it's all completely open source, free. Everything's available, heavily uh, audited by security experts, both in automotive and traditional security standpoint. If anyone else would like to look at it, we welcome you to do it. We're currently about halfway through the IEEE ISTO standardization process. Uh, if you buy a, a new car coming out a year or so uh, from now, then um, there's a pretty good chance that you'll actually be running uh, a variant of Tough inside of that vehicle. And uh, one of the things that was really awesome about this process is also as we worked through this and worked with the automotive community and brought the things we wanted to add into Tough back to the cloud native space, we had really interesting cloud native um, application domains and ways of using this. Um, and improvements come from discussions with folks, especially folks in the CoreOS community on this. So you know, even though people are using Tough in different domains, there's all sorts of um, kind of like uh, cross, uh, cross pollination goodness that happens in our community. Uh, and the last little piece I'm gonna talk about before I hand back over to Trishank for a demo and to talk in more detail about Datadog is doing, is I'm gonna be talking about supply chain security with Tuff and a newer project uh, that uh, I started with a PhD student of mine, Santiago Torres, uh, who will be back in a moment, uh, called Intoto. And uh, Tuff uh, is, uh, you know, the way, uh, it is an effective way to distribute your software, but it really only solves part of the problem. So, you know, you have your version control system, your build system, um, and, uh, you know, your CICD system, and eventually you get to a point where you want to distribute your software. Tough steps in there and does what it's, you know, it, it makes sure that, that bad things don't happen in this last step. But what about all the other steps? What about what happens? So, the Intoto project actually takes cryptographically signed secure metadata from uh, other parts of this process and then goes and is able to integrate this so that a user that goes to install your software knows that there wasn't tampering done. So the same way that if you go and you buy a bottle of aspirin, how do you know that nothing bad is in that aspirin? Well, the FDA approved the drug, first of all. The factory that made it has certain health and safety standards that had to go into doing it. There's a tamper resilient seal on the bottle. There's lot numbers. There's all this stuff in there that goes into protecting that supply chain for that aspirin that you put into your body, right? Um, wouldn't it be nice if we had the same kind of protection for the software that we trust our lives to, right? So that's what Intoto is all about. And it integrates really well with all um, sorts of existing um, uh, pieces of software and signing and things like this. Actually, in the process of doing this work, we found some flaws in the way that Git signing worked and Git actually changed to use our method of Git signing as of about uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, we have been working very closely with the Reproducible Builds Project and have been very active with them. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how they're using Intoto in a second. Um, and have also worked with a lot of CI, CD systems. So this all integrates very smoothly and seamlessly into these existing pipelines and adds very well if you have a new pipeline or a new environment that you want to do it with. And also, um, since this is a tough talk, I should say, it also, uh, the metadata for this all integrates perfectly into Tough and, and Tough uh, can sign and ship it out. And you're going to be hearing a lot about some of the really exciting stuff that happened with that with, uh, from Trishank in a moment, how they did that at Datadog. So um, there are admission controllers. Um, not, I, I guess I should say there's a, you know, a Kubernetes admission controller for, for Tough, which probably comes as, as no big surprise to anyone in the room. Um, but there's also an admission controller for Intoto that's being used in production by some very large sites. 
Uh, you can, um, uh, other folks that have gone and built and deployed this include Control Plane. Um, it's being used by the reproducible builds community to do reproducers for Debian. If you'd like to sign up and uh, run a reproducer and, and be someone else generating in toto metadata so people can be sure that information uh, wasn't stolen, that would be great. Uh, we have an official Jenkins plugin uh, and uh, have had a lot of uh, people work uh, very hard on this. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Trishank to tell you more about uh, Datadog and the way in which uh, Datadog took Tuff and Intoto and fused them together in a cool and interesting way. So, Trishank, take us away. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so, uh, I wanted to get Michael Bay to produce some fireworks and explosions and stuff like that, but I was told we ran out of budget for special effects. So I'll do my best. So, so let me talk about how we took Tuff further uh, at Datadog. So Datadog is a SaaS platform that analyzes infrastructure metrics, uh, your application performance and logs so that your DevOps teams can quickly detect, troubleshoot, and prevent uh, issues occurring in the system. The Datadog agent is software that runs on your host. Uh, it collects events and metrics from your host and sends them to Datadog, where you can analyze your monitoring and performance data. And finally, the agent integrations themselves are plugins that collect metrics and services running on your infrastructure. So there are more than 100 of them that come installed out of the box whenever you install our agent. From now on, when I say integrations, I mean agent integrations, uh, which are to be distinguished from, say, our cloud integrations. OK, so the problem is as follows. The agent releases uh, software on a six-week cycle. And the latest versions of integrations are always bundled with them then. However, we also wanted to publish new integrations independently of the agent release cycle. This is so that customers can beta test new features and bug fixes uh, immediately before we release them as part of the next stable agent. The way the industry typically solves this problem is to use a continuous integration and continuous delivery system, also known as CI-CD for short. There are many valid technical reasons to do so, including faster deployments, clean build environments, and more secure handling of code signing keys. However, if developers are no longer building and signing off packages, then the CI CD system needs to do this. And since packages can be released at any time, it needs to use online keys, or keys that are accessible on demand by the CI CD system in order to sign new metadata about new wheels. Now, what can go wrong with this? When no one has compromised the infrastructure, nothing. But if your developer key has been compromised, then the CI CD system will automatically build and release malware. Or when your version control system has been compromised. Or when your CI CD system has been compromised or when your container image registry used to build packages has been compromised, or when both your key and file servers have been compromised. I think you get the idea. Unfortunately, this is considered the state of the art in the industry. The conventional wisdom has been that there is a necessary trade-off between security and availability. Now, we cannot expect developers to build and sign packages uh, whenever there's change to the source code. This is because source code can change all the time, and it is unreasonable to expect developers uh, to do this expensive job, because that is what CI CD systems are good for, and they generally do do this better. So the thinking has been that, therefore, we must blindly trust our CI CD systems to build and sign packages on demand at the risk of zero compromise resilience. <clears throat> Fortunately, this does not have to be the case. It is indeed unreasonable to expect developers uh, to build and sign packages on demand, a task still best left to your CI CD. At the same time, however, we should not blindly trust that it has not been compromised. So the key idea is to build a tamper-evident pipeline. That is to say, if there is the slightest evidence that the pipeline has been compromised and deviated from its intended behavior anywhere in between, 
then users should not be able to install uh, the resulting malicious code that was never released by your developers. But how do you specify that your authentic pipeline is intended to behave? And how do you verify that it followed this behavior? Intoto lets you do precisely this. Administrators use Intoto to specify their pipeline as a series of steps. Each step may be, for example, a developer writing source code or a container packaging that source code into a zip file. Every step must produce a signed link or attestation about the input that it received and the output that it produced. When end users put together this uh, series of links or signed attestations, they're able to inspect whether a package was produced according to your prescribed series of steps. The Datadog agent integration supply chain looks as follows. In the first step, one of our developers signs Python source code using a YubiKey. We use YubiKeys to prevent exfiltration of signing keys and unauthorized signatures. Every signature requires the entry of a secret pin and or a manual touch operation. So there's two levels of authentication there. In the second step, oops, technical glitch. No, a beautiful presentation. Okay, we're good. All right, anyway, back to order. In the second step, a container uh, packages new integrations that developers shift. And every integration is packaged as a universal Python wheel, uh, which simply means that it's a zip file that contains Python source code that works in both Python 2 and 3 and contains no compile C extensions whatsoever. In the third step, a container uh, signs for new metadata in these wheels. On the end user side, the Datadog agent would transparently download these metadata and wheels and ensure that the source code inside the wheel contains exactly the source code that one of our developers produced. Now, putting it all together, we use Tough to bootstrap uh, how every part of the entire system is to be trusted. We use offline keys with Tough to securely distribute the root of trust for the whole system. Our supply chain, including developer signing keys, and the public keys used to verify the supply chain. Tough also guarantees that man the middle uh, attackers cannot tamper with the consistency, authenticity, uh, and uh, integrity of our integrations, nor roll back or indefinitely replay metadata. So there are other considerations in production that I haven't discussed here, such as scaling the tough bandwidth used to transport in total metadata as the number of our integrations released grow, or being able to index integrations for package managers using solely tough metadata. The key point, though, is that this offline bootstrapping of trust and protecting developer signing keys with YubiKeys is what gives Intoto meaningful security guarantees in this case. In short, using both Tough and Intoto allows you to build tamper evidence CI CD pipelines despite running on untrusted hardware on the cloud. Okay, so what does this tamper evident pipeline buy us? In order to increase uh, usability, we require only one of our developers to sign and release integrations at any time. This means that the compromise of a developer key can theoretically uh, cause malicious code to be released. However, we generate and keep developer signing keys on YubiKeys. Furthermore, we require the entry of a secret pin and a manual touch operation to authorize signatures, which I will show you shortly. Thus, we believe we have done the best we can to significantly minimize the risk of a key compromise without hampering developer usability. Uh, in the future, we may require, say, a threshold of two developer signing keys to be able to trust the integration at all. Now, what the tamper evident pipeline shines in is in how it protects us against man in the middle attacks against our infrastructure itself. So, for example, attackers who compromise our GitHub repository cannot cause malicious integrations to be released. This is because Stefan and Toto would block 
these malicious integrations from being installed by the agent, as the signatures would not match what we expect from our developer signing keys. Likewise, when our CI CD system has been compromised. Likewise, when our container image registry has been compromised. Or even when both our key and file servers have been compromised. Now, all of the security has got to be simply unusable, right? That is the reputation of uh, <laughs> security after all. So let's put this to the test. Let me quickly show you what our developers and end users experience. OK, so this is uh, one of our developers, uh, from their point of view, how a source code will be released. So what happens is that they would check out a branch and edit source code and so on. And when they're ready to release uh, their source code to, to build new wheels, what they would do is, is use an internal cool uh, tool called Datadog Checks Dev, which basically does things like bump version numbers and so on. And we simply use this to uh, uh, call in Toto to call YubiKey, which in turn would sign uh, metadata. So let me show you how painful and onerous that is. Oh, it's telling me to touch my YubiKey, which is precisely what I'm going to do. So even if this malware is sitting on my machine, trying to, trying to get me to sign something, I would know. So let's see what that actually did. That checked in a, a signed file to their, to their GitHub repository. And what it looks like is like this. It's a signed file, as you can see. And it's got the hashes of all of Python source code. What happens after here when you push code to GitHub, uh, our pipeline actually does a lot of the complexity, right? Takes all of this metadata, produces new tough metadata, makes new wheels, and releases them. So a few minutes later, when users want to install, we put them through an equally painful procedure. So let's see how painful it is. I got I to gotta see the demo by twisting my neck. Let's hope this works. OK. All right, so this is a new feature, right? So what happens when they install? So you first download a, a whole lot of uh, bootstrapping of metadata of trust. The long story short is that Tuff takes care of downloading the supply chain for you, which is signed using offline keys. It downloads the public keys used to verify the supply chain. It downloads link metadata produced by containers in between. And importantly, the uh, developer signed metadata, which is here, I believe. So anyway, at the end, it also tells you that in Toto verified that the wheel contain exactly the source code that our developers produce. So we want to see what it looks like, the nitty gritty details, what's actually happening behind the scenes, if you're interested in a verbose output, is that the, the key interesting part is this. We literally unzip the wheel. We simply zip off. We transparently do it for users. And check that the Python source code inside is precisely what was signed with my YubiKey earlier. So in this way, we make sure that the robot cannot misbehave, that our containers cannot package source code that we never released. So let me go back to the presentation. So to conclude, uh, sorry. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first tamper evidence CI, CI CD pipeline in the industry. By integrating both Tuff and Intoto, we believe that we have set a new standard uh, for the secure delivery of software. Datadog customers can enjoy beta testing this with Agent 6.8, which was released uh, just earlier today, so get it while it's still hot. So to conclude, Tuff serves as the crucial foundation for building compromised resilient software repositories and various demanding settings, including automatically and securely delivering software in modern DevOps environments. So versions of Tuff, I'm very pleased to say, are being integrated or have been deployed by these various organizations to help secure their users. We're very proud and honored to be part of the CNCF. Uh, also, as we speak, as Justin alluded to earlier, Uptain uh, is going through a standardiz standardization process for, uh, for vehicles in the uh, North American auto industry, at the, at, the, at the very least. So let me quickly acknowledge uh, the gracious help of many people who helped to make Tuff what it is today. In particular, our recent deployment at Datadog 
has helped us to battle test both tough and in toto and makes them even better. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And now we'd like to take your questions, if any. Yes. So you the, could. So the question is, would signing the commits for your releases not be sufficient? Right. So that's a good question. So what would signing the Git? So, so first of all, Justin and his team and his students, Santiago, found out that their problem with Git commit signing, which Justin will get into uh, with more sure. details. Yeah, so, so let me, uh, the, the answer is, is no for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the, it, it, it's good. I mean, it's better than not signing them. Sure. Uh, but it's not as, you, you don't know that the thing that you signed was the thing that got built. So you, you don't know when you install software, like what actually, Happen. Yep. Uh huh. Yep. So, so, yeah, so you sign the Git commit, but what are you really signing? How would you check on the agent side that you're getting the source code corresponding to that Git commit? And the problem gets trickier when you transform source into binaries. And that's a much harder problem, right? So yeah, um, right. But but there there are problems even even in that regard. Like because in practice, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe some companies just let anybody push to master to go and build stuff out in production with like no code review or whatever else. In some cases, organizations actually want to look at code and actually want to go through a process. And being able to take whatever process you use non judgmentally. So in Toto is not judgmental. Tough is not judgmental. We can take your, your process non-judgmentally and make sure that that process actually happens. And, and make sure that you know, if someone goes in and you forgot to disable a key for your intern last summer or something like that, and their system got compromised, that all of a sudden um, you're not on the front page of uh, pick your favorite tech news site. Yeah, if I could add to that, it's not just that. Think about good commit signing. Nobody checks the signatures. And, and the second thing is, how do you find? Oh, oh, we, we do it transparently for you. That's the difference. You have a procedure. Yeah. Well, the, the procedure is, is that whoever develops the tool that you're going to do install with does a one-time integration, and you don't even know it's there. It's the same right, with Tuff. Exactly. Like, like, we, in fact, didn't find yeah. out that some groups were using Tuff until after they had you know, gone and either been protected from an attack or typoed something and then started to have tough related error messages because they typoed an expiration time on a key and caused it to expire artificially. So it's totally transparent to users. Um, it's just, you know, as a developer, you know, yeah. It's, exactly, it's developers. One, it, yeah. It's just part of, your, it's part of your commit script or whatever else you already run. So other, uh, if I could add another point to that. The other point is how do you distribute a developer public keys? That needs to be a secure process by itself. And that's a famous problem with GPG key distribution. You don't know how you're getting the right keys, whether the key has been revoked. That's what Tuff does for you. Yeah, Tuff and Intoto handle that. Uh, I think we had another question. Yes? Yeah, I was wondering if you could reflect on what you do for binaries. Um, you so you, you mean uh, basically how do you handle the fact that you start with source code and then something, you know, some compilation step happens and then you have a binary. Right, okay, so there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things with this. So the, the easiest and most pervasive answer based on what we've already done is to just say reproducible builds. Basically, um, the, you know, we have worked with the reproducible builds community for a couple of years now, quite a while, been very active with them, and their reproducers are actually, you know, there are reproducers at multiple sites that are generating in toto metadata and doing this. And this gives you assurance that if somebody broke into one of those reproducers and started to monkey around with it, that it would be detected. You have to break into all of them. So that's sort of the, the short and easy answer. And Santiago, who's made it in, go ahead. Uh, why don't you jump in and answer this? Uh, you should get the mic. Yeah. Uh, but I need to follow your train of thought, though. Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so. Just speak, just speak. Yeah, so 
just hold it. OK. Um, so actually, while we were talking, um, the Reproducible Build Summit just ended. And uh, part of the announce uh, announcements in there is that there's an app transport for Debian that basically does this for you. As uh, Trishank says, it needs to be transparent for people. Uh, they just need to do apt install, apt get install, get a Debian package, and uh, well, know if it was actually tampered with or not. Uh, there's also something to be said about namespacing. In the in the case of Datadog, well, it's it's very clear that you that developers can actually change anything in the repository, but uh, you can also do namespacing at the level of PO files, right? The team that's uh, in charge of uh, changing the localization scripts or writing new localization scripts shouldn't be able to change a make file. And the team that's uh, in charge of uh, updating your mess and build scripts shouldn't be changing your, uh, your source code and so on and so forth. The idea within Toto is that you're able to like, thoroughly inspect at the, even to the file or I mean, I don't think the engine doesn't support like even line level uh, granularity to be able to tell you exactly what went, uh, what went wrong and who can touch anything. Um, I don't know if this answers your question. I'm sorry? Uh, yes. Uh, that's a non-starter in a lot of the environments I work in. That's true. Um, I, we were speaking with a couple of fintech people, and they actually take the whole uh, source code and they compile it themselves. That, that's a, that's a trade-off that you're, you're willing to make in terms of security. Actually, uh, most of these vulnerability scanners, they just learn hashes of uh, known malicious files. And if your compilation is not bit by bit reproducible, well, good luck with that, because your file is different this time. Yeah, and let, let me add one other thing, which is that... So we should scratch Java off. No, 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 no. So, so well, let, let, let me add one other thing to this, which is that uh, bit by bit reproducibility in, you think, in a complex environment is nice. But this isn't, like, core to what it means to be in Toto. If you have an environment that you think is, like, like if you just want to know, did it actually build on our freaking build server, mm -hmm. we, can, we can validate that. Even better if you have something like some sort of TPM setup or something that you trust that, that makes your that process more trustworthy. We can validate all that within the framework. So this is part of the kind of non-judgmental. If you go the extra mile for reproducible builds, we take advantage of it. If you can't for your environment, we take advantage of what you've got. And, and when you say like you can reproduce that happen on my build server, that's by using all that, that's by your build server having an HSM, a TPM, whatever else like that. And that will get you into, you know, uh, possibly in the news because someone broke into your build server as they've done with Fedora and Debian and a couple of other, you know, historical situations like it. But it's better than somebody just being able to build somebody else, somewhere else, yeah. and, and have stuff be trusted. So, you know. Yeah. Ah, it's interesting you should mention that because there's a proposal called sub-resource integrity, if I remember it correctly. The basic idea is you would, you would use TLS to distribute the hashes of all the JavaScript files that you're using. And I think you could do even more. So if your CDN tries to substitute and give you something else, you would know. It's a small, light version of stuff, but not, 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 not to hold you back. I forget how the bootstrapping works. That's a good point, but I believe I believe uh, I believe there's a one-time first first. Um, you you can't forge the the certificate, for example, I right? Will, I will say this general area is something we'd be very happy to have on our roadmap as a future improvement to Tuff and or in Toto. Ah, tough, tough, and in total in your browser. Imagine that. Someone needs to write a whole bunch of JavaScript for that. Any takers? Any other questions for us? Yes.
Okay, so the, the question is, is that when you have a user go and get uh, information from a repository, is there a better solution than trust on first use? And the, the answer is, is that uh, yes, but it depends on your domain. So often, like this happens one of two ways. Either it's trust on first use, the first time you fire up your client, or your client itself comes shipped with some root keys or something like that in it. Those are the fundamental models that, that exist today. Tough is used in both scenarios. So it works both ways. Um, and it's really up to you and your domain what makes sense for your users. Yeah, the, the way it works with Tough is that you would ship a trusted copy of this file. So for example, this comes with the agent. That's how we know we can trust whatever signatures that we see. Right, if, if you bundle. Yeah, if you bundle with the client, you'd ship all the stuff with it. If you do trust in first use, then you would you would trust that you know that the X509 cert was okay because your CA said so. Download this the first time, then after that, if there was that kind of compromise, you'd be okay. And both models are used heavily in cloud native environments. Yes. So, what are your any thoughts on some of the problems with like the um, source code repositories and like where you have malicious package authors? NPM was recently and uh, things like that where maybe you don't necessarily trust all the authors or all the things that depend on or how do you uh -huh. This, this is an in-toto question, if I've ever heard one. So, uh, yeah, but I, I, think I, couldn't, I, I think I oh. couldn't hear the whole story. Oh, sorry, let me, I'll, I'll rephrase the question, and then yeah. you can jump in, and if you want, you can toss over. Right. The question is, is that, well, we've seen a lot of situations, like, for instance, in, with a popular NPM package where a developer um, went and handed it over to some unknown person, and then bad things happen. Right. So how, do you, how would anything in this domain possibly protect against attacks like that, and what, what do you think? So uh, I think a nice side effect of using Intoto is that it introduces processes for things like this. Uh, I, I know that the specific example, uh, like a month ago, was uh, like everyone was screaming to the sky. And it was pretty much like, hey, this very nice developer did a tool, didn't have any interest in, interest in it for like a while. And some guy, some random guy was like, can I have it? Uh, and well, all of the people, like the BBC, and the, they were like, well, you're handing like crucial code to like some random guy, some random guy. In theory, with a, in total, you can have these processes also well defined. And uh, well, you could also have the fact that, well, you trust this guy, but you don't trust anyone else. And then uh, as a consequence, you can say, hey, uh, I'm downloading the, the layout for this piece of, uh, piece of software. And suddenly, the guy who's supposed to like, tag this release is not doing it. What's happening? Right. And, and just to kind of hammer on that point, because Intoto makes you make all this information visible, um, there are people that are very excited in looking at all this metadata and trying to create things like scores about how concerned you should be that there's something wrong with this project. So all of a sudden, if that project goes from a green smiley face to, you know, like a orange concern frown, then maybe before you deploy that in your infrastructure, you'll look a little more closely at that and try to suss out what might be happening. Um, so for the first time, you can tell that's happening if you deploy things like Intoto. I think it's also important to acknowledge an important limitation, which is that if you transfer developer keys, for example, signing keys, at some point, all the cryptography in the world is not going to be able to save you. So there, there are important human factors there as well. But yeah, but one of the things about Tuff and Intoto is if you use them right, you never need to share keys. You never, ever need to. Sure. If you use them wrong, it, like people are used to sharing keys because they're used to terrible solutions Practices. that don't work well. Right. Because you have delegations. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, very happy to engage with anybody who might be interested in learning more about Tough or participating in our community. Thank you.